95 6 says come let us bow down and worship let us kneel before the lord our maker Come to worship you, Lord. We come to honor you, Lord. We come to know you more, Lord. We come to worship. we can do we fall on our face in front of you True, you are true. 
Even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy. You're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life. In you, death has lost its sting. Into your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reigns. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord. You are the Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I may grow. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. Oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world, forever rain. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world. will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus To your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever rain. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever rain. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. Good morning. We are delighted that you're with us today. We want to say welcome from the one who says to us, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Thanks for sharing your morning with us today. We have several good things to let you know about and remind you of first. Again, we want to say welcome to all, especially to those who are new to Mariners. Thanks for being with us. We'd encourage you to use that link on the screen to connect. Thank you. Also, our fall festival is coming up on October 31st. It will include trunk or treat, and this will be done safely. 
invite your neighbors, let everyone in on the fun, October 31st. Also, it's coming. Within the next couple of weeks, we're going to be announcing some adjustments in our worship schedule and some important news about Thanksgiving and Christmas and even something ancient and something brand new that God is going to be doing in our midst this January. It's coming. Stay tuned. But for now, let's stay connected in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, thank you for being with us here today, this morning. Jesus loves us, this we know, for the Bible tells us so. You own not only the cattle on a thousand hills, but every drop in every ocean, every ounce of monetary wealth, and you are the author of every wisp of unconditional love. With that in mind, we need your help. We confess to be faithful to your good vision for our lives, we lift up to you our tiredness and ask you for energizing love. We lift up to you our sickness and sorrow and ask for your healing presence and power. We lift up to you our sins of omission and commission and ask for your forgiveness. We lift up to you our arguments and conflicts and ask for your justice and peace and holiness that passes all understanding. We continue to lift up our leaders and all who shoulder responsibility for the lives of others. As well, we lift up the weakest and most vulnerable in our midst, knowing that even a sparrow cannot fall to the earth without your loving care being summoned. Lord, in these weeks of October and November, Make us, we pray, a truly grateful people, too grateful to be overcome by hatred or anxiety or fear. Thank you for suffering with us. Thank you for overcoming for us. Thank you for all you provide this community of faith and beyond. In our weakness, you prove great. In our faithfulness, you prove even more faithful still. Indeed, Little ones, to you belong. We are weak, but you are strong. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship uh, at Mariners. Our first hymn today that we're going to be singing was written by somebody that was deaf. Uh, It's pretty impressive. Uh, The first time that this was ever heard. Uh, was hundreds of years ago. Uh, You've probably heard it. It's probably one of your cell phone ringtones. It's been used all over the place. But one of the things that's amazing about this is that it's talking about uh, the joy that we have in Christ. The original song was sort of the joy that we have in each other as people, and there's nothing wrong with that. But this just takes it a step further. So let's just open up this service today and sing joyfully to our God. Joy of living, ocean depth. 
hearts are full of joy, we want to um, just remember the way that the Lord blesses us. I read it on a church sign one time. It was a little reminder to me that if I want to be rich, I just need to stop and count my blessings. And that's what this song um, reminds us to do, to just count our blessings. I was blind, now I'm seeing a color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. I had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a ruin to treasure. I've been given a hope and a future. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Let it go trusting when I cannot see. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Surely every season you are good to. Did you know that when you and I mess up, when we just do things that are wrong, God is so loving that he still loves us. Today, Miss Jill and Mr. Bill are here to share with all of us, children and those who are children at heart, how great that is. Let's listen. 
And good morning, families. We're so happy to be here together with you again here at Kids Church. We miss you, and we can't wait till we can be together in person. But today we are sharing a really important lesson. It's the central lesson that Jesus taught us, the importance of forgiveness and, and just the, the power of forgiveness in our lives. It's really the central story of why Jesus came and why, why God gave us his son is for our forgiveness. And so mm -hmm. Peter... You were with Jesus uh, for I was. three years. I was, three years. With him, and I three know years. that there were several times where he, you asked about forgiveness, and he shared how many times we should forgive. I, w I was with him for three years, you're right. And I'd be glad to talk about that. That'd be great. Good. Well, good morning, kids. Yes, indeed, I, I'm always glad to come here. I wish I could be with you in person, but since I can't, uh, I think this will work for today. I want to tell you this story. I want to tell you about... Jesus and forgiveness. Like Jill said, it's just the central premise of what Jesus was all about. As we walked along through the many, many miles, we talked to many people, and Jesus talked to us, his closest friends, and he told us about the things that were just so, so important to us. Forgiveness, I think, was probably the top thing that we can do in our lives. So important to you. He wants us to be able to forgive, and he wants us to be able to accept for forgiveness. As we walked along, we talked about uh, a time when uh, I had a hard time with my little brother, Andrew. You guys know about brothers and sisters. Sometimes they can be quite difficult. and Sometimes you stay mad at them for a long time. But Jesus told me, no matter what Andrew did, no matter how angry I was with him, that I needed to forgive him. Well, I was confused because uh, it was a little hard to per forgive my little brother. He didn't always treat me the way that I thought that he should. Well, I asked Jesus as we were walking along, I said, Jesus, if someone does you wrong, how many times do you have to forgive him? I thought seven times. I picked a number. Seven times seemed like a lot to me, and he, he stopped in the middle of the road. He put his arm on my shoulder, and he said, Peter, Seven times is nothing. It's not nearly enough. Well, I said, well, Jesus, how many times is enough? He said, Peter, seven times 70. <sighs> wow, that's a lot of times to forgive somebody. I said, Jesus, that's almost 500 times. You have Peter, seven times 70. And maybe that's not even enough. When someone does you wrong, the only way that you're going to get over that is to forgive them. It doesn't sound right, does it? It seems like you would want to get mad. It seems like you would want to strike back. It seems like you would want to make things equal. But Jesus said, no, Peter, that is not the way. You forgive, and you forgive, and you forgive. And I said, well, God, how about me? How many times do you think God forgives me? He said, Peter, I know you, Peter. He's forgiven you a lot more than 70 times 7. And I said, well, you know what? That makes a lot of sense, Jesus. I think I understand what you're talking about. We need to forgive over and over again. It's the only way that we can live our lives happily and not go through our lives angry and bitter about something that somebody did to us. We all have people in our lives who have done us wrong. But don't we have people who we have done wrong? And don't we appreciate it when they forgive us? It's so true. It's so true. So this is the message. And you know, it's why he came to us. It's why he died on the cross for us. is so that we could be forgiven for all of the many, 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 seven times seventy, sins that we have done. We have to forgive in the hopes that we will be forgiven. We forgive others so that God will forgive us. So the next time, kids, that somebody does you wrong, the next time somebody picks on you, bullies you, takes your toys, doesn't include you when you want to play with somebody, shake it off, kids. Forgive them. Tell them that you love them. 
like Jesus told us that he loves us, even though we have done so many wrong, bad things, he still loves us every day he forgives us. So, so important. Well, that's it for today, kids. I'm going to get back on the road and walk a little bit further. But when I come back next time, I hope that I'll have another lesson for you. Until then, be good. Our next hymn is one that I'm sure you might have heard once or twice. Um, maybe you've been singing it for a while. Uh, Jesus Loves Me. And it's an interesting one. Um, the theologian Karl Barth, uh, when he was asked, how do you summarize all of the works that you've written and everything that you've written about theology and about scripture? They said, if you could sum it up, what would you sum it up as? And he said, Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's the gospel. It's the gospel in, in three verses. And, I mean, Christ even says, let the little children come unto me. This is a very profound and easy hymn. So enjoy it with everyone that is sitting around with you today. And um, really dig into the words, as simple as they are. him our next hymn is one that I'm sure you might have heard once or twice um, maybe you've been singing it for a while uh, Jesus loves me and it's an interesting one um, the theologian Karl Barth uh, when he was asked how do you summarize all of the works that you've written and everything that you've written about theology and about scripture? They said, if you could sum it up, what would you sum it up as? And he said, Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's the gospel. It's the gospel in, in three verses. And, I mean, Christ even says, let the little children come unto me. This is a very profound and easy hymn. So enjoy it with everyone that is sitting around with you today and um, really dig into the words as simple as they are. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. This is Isabella, this is Jackson, and we're here to read the scripture for you today. Uh, today's first passage comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ, sets your hearts on things above, where Christ is, and seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. This next strip here is from Romans 11, verse 36. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. This morning I want to take you for a little stroll down memory lane. This is my birth church, St. John's United Methodist, a church rich in heritage, incredible pastors, and wonderful people. Every Sunday, this is where my family would come and we would worship. It's also where I began my journey with MYF, the Methodist Youth Fellowship. And I'm proud to say that out of that youth group, there have been seven pastors birthed. Now I'd like to invite you to come inside and join me in the room where it all began. Well, here it is. This is the room where it all began. I would come in every Sunday morning when mom and dad would drop me off and come into a brightly colored room. My teacher would already be there. There would be a desk much like this or several desks that were there and chairs that we could sit in. And there was a lesson that was taught every single Sunday. This is where I first learned about what Pastor David talked about last week. They taught me about Shabbat. Although I don't remember it back then as being Shabbat, I remember them saying it was a day of rest or a, a holy day of rest for the Lord. I also remember that this is where my first teaching about giving, about tithing began. It began with a project that my Sunday school teacher had helped us with. We had these little kits that we were able to put together and glue together, and they looked much like this. And when we got them together, there was different slots where that we would drop our coins in. One would be for what we could spend. One would be what we were to share with others. There would be another slot that we would be saving. And then there's this one slot that where we would be giving, where generosity would begin, or the tithe, as I came to know it. So I, at that point in time, would have an allowance, and I would come in and take my allowance. And one of the first things that we did was understood that the first thing we do is that we give to the Lord. Well, I didn't always stay in the Sunday school room. My faith walk grew. I grew. And so did my teachings. And as I grew, my allowance would grow. As my allowance would grow, my tithe would also grow as well. And I take those lessons, those early lessons into life with me now and understand exactly what, yes, that day of rest is, but also how that my giving increases and what incredible generosity is all about. So let's chat for just a few moments this morning. There is a saying that we all have heard, and we've probably said it before, that hindsight is always twenty twenty. When we look back on our life, we look back at the things that we should have done, or maybe the things that we should have done, and our vision is perfect in that. But for the next couple of minutes, I want to share with you a new saying, that foresight is twenty twenty. That we can hear from Jesus on how that our future can be just as clear as our past. Why that you and I have not been able to have perfect vision about our future is because we've been so focused on the temporary instead of being focused on the eternal. Paul has given us a warning about our situation with today's passage. Let's revisit that passage. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your minds on things above, not on the earthly things. Jesus shares his wisdom with us about this passage in a story that's recorded in Matthew 25. It, it's a parable. It's a rather long parable, so I want to remind us of that parable, but I'm going to paraphrase. There was a master, and he was getting ready to go on a long journey. And he brought together three of his servants, and he gave his property to each one of the servants. To one he gave five talents, to one he gave two talents, and to the other he gave one talent. And then the master went away. It says the master had been gone for a long time, and when he returned, 
he called all of the servants together, which he had entrusted the talents to, for an accounting of what had happened. To the one that he'd given to five, the servant came back and said, look, master, I have doubled what you've given me. Here are 10 talents. And the master smiled and he looked at him and he said, well done. The same exact conversation happened to the one that he had entrusted the two talents to who had doubled what he had been given. But then the conversation changed when the person he had given the one talent to said, I was fearful. I was scared. So I buried the talent. And when you came back, I knew I could dig it up and I would give you back exactly what you had given me. And the master looked at the one who had one talent that just gave him back what he had given him. And here are the words that he said. He said, you wicked and lazy servant. Ouch. Wow, that really stings. But I think that that should give us an insight and a clear perspective on how much stewardship matters. To God. Jesus' opening words in Matthew 25, prior to this story, are these words The kingdom of heaven will be like this. And then Jesus proceeds with this story. With these words, Jesus is giving us insight, better yet, perfect insight, 2020 vision on what our future looks like. He's sharing with us how stewardship today will impact eternity. To live our lives with the greatest impact for eternity, you and I must understand that we own nothing. In verse 14, it says this, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. The key word there is his property. Everything that they had, everything they were holding in their hands from that moment on did not belong to them at all belonged to the master. We must shift our owner set mind thinking to a stewardship heart set living, believing that everything belongs to God. God created us to be like him. So you and I were created to be grace-filled, to be generous, to be generous givers with everything that belongs to God. He's entrusted us with this. You see, if our mindset thinking is that whatever is in our hands belongs only to us, then it is never possible to really let go of it. From our hearts at living, believing that everything belongs to God, believing that everything that God has given us, we are only stewarding, then our generosity becomes overflowing because we understand that nothing that we have is ours to be selfish with or to claim. Everything is His entrusted to us so that we can share. When God asks us for the tithe, when God asks us for the masaser, it makes us change from a mindset thinking to a stewardship, heart-set living where our obedience to the tithe becomes then a proclamation that God owns everything. Let me remind you of a couple weeks ago when we heard from Leviticus that one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to Him as holy. Every time our allowance increases, every time that our paychecks are cashed, we have an opportunity to proclaim, God, all of this is yours. Growing up into adulthood, I was on the seesaw, in the seesaw, excuse me. I was teeter-tottering back and forth between mindset thinking, it's all mine, I worked for it, I deserve it, I should be able to keep it, and going the opposite direction into heart-set living, where that it belongs to you, God. You have given it to me, and you've entrusted it with me so that I can honor you with it, but it also enables me to be a generous giver. What made this complete shift into heart set living was a study of what is now my life verse. That life verse comes from Romans eleven thirty six. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. Glory be to God. Amen. For from him comes everything. That is the very foundation that our heart set 
living springs from. Earlier in my life, I lost an entire 15-year pension because of a meltdown in the company that I was working for. Not only did I lose the pension, but I lost all of the money that I had been putting in, that I had been contributing to the pension as well. And what happened in losing that pension, the spiral went downward. I was not able to recoup fast enough. And so therefore, what began to happen was late payments on a lot of different things. And eventually, I lost the house. Eventually, we lost the automobile that we were living with also. You see, after all of that happened, I began waiting. I began waiting for the anger to come. I began waiting for the discouragement to come. I began waiting for all of this downtrodden heart that was going to be sinking inside of me to come. But it never came. None of that ever came because I realized that everything that I had lost, it wasn't mine to begin with. And that everything that I've regained since that day, all of the stuff that we now have, that's not ours either. It all belongs to God. And we are stewards of that. To live our lives with the greatest impact for eternity, we must understand that there will be an audit. In Matthew, in verse 19, it says, The master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. He's asking, what did you do with what I gave you? Now, I want to set the thinking straight about what type of examination this will be and what type of examination this isn't. When my dad would come to me as a young man and he would ask me this question, what do you need to tell me? He would ask. And I'm thinking before I answered, what does he know? And what doesn't he know? I was scared. I was fearful, much like the person that had been given the one talent. I knew that depending upon what I told him, I might be getting in even more trouble than I'm possibly already in. This is not the scenario that Jesus is talking about here when he says there will be a settling of accounts. Yes, there is always grace in God. Yes. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Yes, there is always perfect love in Christ that casts out all fear. But we will stand before God and answer the question, what have you done with everything that I gave to you to steward? Listen to Paul's words from Romans 10 on this. Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord. Every knee will bow to me. Every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Paul is writing to the believers about standing before God and sharing how we ran our race. This account should not bring to mind this image of Judge Judy standing in front of you, you standing in front of the bench with the gavel raised overhead, ready to bring down the punishment or the judgment on you. It should also not bring to mind this image of an angry God that is standing over you, gavel in hand, ready to bring down his entire wrath upon you. I want you to think about this moment of accounting as God encouraging you, as God praising you, As God joyfully shouting, come on, take what I've given you. Keep running. Run the race well. Keep stewarding. Keep stewarding everything that I've entrusted you with. God is not only encouraging you in this moment, but God is also planning what he's going to reward you with as a good steward. And what he's going to reward you with is something that will never, ever fade. This is not an examination to be feared. It's an examination that can be rejoiced in. If you knew, and you do know, and I know, that we are going to stand before God, and we're going to tell him what we did, 
with all that he has given to us. And we know that he longs to reward us. He longs to look at us and say, well done. Then what would you and I be doing differently in our lives? Now, I know that all of you are saying, yes, that's the way I want to run my race. Yes, that's exactly what I want. I want to live a life, not from a mindset thinking that is mine, but from a heart set, believing that everything that I have belongs to God. And I've been entrusted with it. I want to live out of that heart set and I want to impact lives for eternity. I really do. So how do we do that? How do you and I live in stewardship obedience? To live our lives with the greatest impact for eternity, you and I must stop being consumers, making withdrawals for the temporary. And we must begin being disciples that are making investments for eternity. Withdrawals for the temporary are nothing more than trading one thing for the other. I'm going to take this out so I can get that. But deposits for eternity are investing in the kingdom with an expectation of a far greater return. Today, we stop thinking from our temporary ownership mindset and we begin living from our eternity heart set. We begin investing everything that we've been entrusted with. Every second of every day, we get to decide how that we are going to spend our gifts, how we're going to spend our talents, how we're going to spend our resources, how we are going to spend our time, and our resources. But we can spend free time scrolling social media, or we can invest that time mentoring someone, moving them forward in their faith. We can spend our energy sweating, setting up schedules, programs, and methods to control our children's behavior, which is not a bad thing. We want to guide them in the right direction. But think about this. What if we invested that amount of energy on our knees as an intercessor, praying the Holy Spirit down upon our children every day, asking the Holy Spirit to help us move them closer and closer to Jesus. That is an investment for their eternity. We can spend our time planning on how best to leverage our resources so we can acquire the latest things. We can acquire the latest fashion. We can acquire the latest tech gadget, the latest automobile upgrade, or the best and greatest new entertainment package that's out there. Or we can invest that planning time, like the family who came and said, Pastor Woody, we canceled our 100 channel cable package. Or the other man that came and he said, you know what? I have given up my season membership. And the young lady who came to me and said, I've stopped several many of my monthly subscriptions that I had that I wasn't really using, each and every one of them all saying, I want to reallocate, I want to dedicate that line item, and I want to invest in further mission and outreach of the church. When you and I commit to a heart-set life of investing for God, it changes us, it impact, and it also impacts heaven. When we were going to Costa Rica, I remember the first year that we went, all of the kids that went with us, incredible, incredible time that we had. But every one of them brought their own money, American dollars. And they became so enamored with colonies. And they all knew what the rate of exchange was. What they did, they took all of their American dollars, almost every single one of them, and they went in and they exchanged them for colonies. And they just thought it was really cool to be able to say, wow, instead of this number of dollars, I now have 20,000 colones in my pocket. It was exciting and it was wonderful because it worked really well while we were there for a brief time because they were worth something there. But when they finally came home, the pocket full of coins was really worth nothing. Let's think about all the things that we have spent our lifetime acquiring, all the things that we worry over, all the things that we're holding on to, all of those things being worthless when we get to our true home, to our final home. 
heaven. All that technology that promised endless hours of entertainment, it will be nothing compared to the choirs and the praises that will be sung forever. All the things that we needed here to make us notice and show people who we are or who we wanted to be in heaven, that very facade will not matter because your true identity is that you are a daughter or you are a son of the king. That and only that is where your true identity is. All of the money, all of the investments, all of the stocks, all of the bonds that are acquired here, they don't roll over in heaven. Well, what you will roll over when you get to heaven are the streets that are paved with more gold than you and I could ever, ever imagine. Our only response to God, who held nothing back, God held nothing back. He created us in his image, and he gave us a son, his one and only son, that through him we could have everlasting life. Our only response to a God who has held nothing back, who gave us everything, our only response to Jesus' teaching, showing us that we can see our future with perfect vision, and how we can invest now, and what we invest now will impact eternity, is to live a life of open generosity. Let me share what I know about each one of you. You are all 10 talent people, and you are all born for such a time as this. You are all also joined together as the body of Christ in a 10-talent church. The 10-talent church has more opportunity to reach more people than any other time in history and move them closer to Jesus Christ. To whom much is given, much will be expected. You are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the power of the resurrection. But your life of stewardship will impact eternity. Who will be the people in heaven? Because of your open-handed, Heart set living, generosity. I would like to invite you now into our time of communion. In the beginning, you alone, God, made the world, and it was perfect. You created fresh, clean breezes and powerful winds to sculpt your natural wonders. You created oscillating oceans, rushing rivers, silent streams, all declaring your glory. You created flowers of every color that you could dream of, giving many a perfume that is unmatched in their delight. The trees you created to tower into the heavens, a brilliant habitat for such a variety of creatures, you made a place for every creature, those we can see, and those so small that we never knew were even there, each life depending upon another for its existence. Each and every life essential to your masterpiece. Thank you for placing us in such a delightful garden of Eden. We also want to thank you also for all people. You have helped them find a place to live everywhere, and in every place we have found, your abundant blessings. According to your great wisdom, you created us with a marvelous diversity. We have devised a myriad of languages, each one essential for us to proclaim your greatness. And when one of those languages goes silent, your praise is diminished. We have instituted a plethora of cultures seeking to live out your wisdom in great complexity. When one of those cultures is eclipsed, our understanding of you is diminished. Each and every person is essential to your masterpiece also. Thank you for placing us within this, your marvelous family. Together we worship your holy name. Together we sing praises of your greatness. Together, joining with the grand diversity of heaven, 
adding our voices to their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are those who come in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, and so is Jesus. Your presence with us. Jesus was born in a certain place and time in Bethlehem at the time of Herod the king, but continues to be found among us in every place for all time. Jesus spoke the languages of Palestine, but his name is spoken in every language found in the world. What you sent Jesus to do was not just for one people, but for all people. Not just for some people in the world, but to bring salvation to all peoples of the world. Your promise of grace is good news for all. And we are still instructed to go into all the world to teach his truth. To show us how to care for one another, Jesus broke with custom. The teacher chose to wash the feet of the students. The leader chose to serve the needs of the followers. The one others saw as most worthy cared for those who felt least worthy. You and I are encouraged to do the same. To show us how to care for one another, Jesus took the bread of Passover, a yearly reminder that there were still people being oppressed. And with a prayer of thanksgiving, he broke it and shared it with us all, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. As often as you partake of this, do it in remembrance of me. To show us how to care for one another, Jesus took the last cup of Passover, seen as a reminder to not give up hope in God's promised mercy. And with the prayer of thanksgiving, he shared the cup with all of us, saying, drink with me. This is my cup, my blood poured out, believing in God's eternal covenant of grace, granting you forgiveness for your sins and for all the sins of all who trust in God's word. We are encouraged to do the same. All over the world, people are crying out for what Christ has died to give them. It is this faith. It is this hope. It is this very love that we feel called to share. And so, because of the truth we find in this holy mystery, we proclaim our faith in Christ. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O oh, gracious breeze, soothing stream, anoint these gifts of bread and wine. Reveal to us through them the body and blood of Christ, God's expressed love for the whole world. O oh, gracious breeze, soothing stream, anoint the gift of our lives in all of its grand diversity. Reveal to the world through us, your church, the heart of Christ, and the compassion of his bride. God expressed love for the whole world. O oh, most gracious God, bless your church throughout the world. Use our great diversity to create beautiful harmonies between each other. Help us see how we are fitted together in your great web of life that we might be a richer blessing to all people. Open our hearts to receive each other in a way that extends your loving presence. Find joy through our unity, O oh God. Find hope through our cooperation. Find beauty through our interconnectedness with all the great triune God as we seek to live in accordance to your will. And now may we join with the world praying together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you would take your bread or whatever element that you brought with you. And, and, and even again, if you didn't bring anything with you today, then don't worry about that. You can join with us in, in the anointed spirit of God. Jesus took the bread. And he gave thanks to God. And he broke the bread. Take 
eat. This is my body given for you. And then he took the cup. And he again returned thanks for heaven. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all people. Drink of this. Would you please join me in prayer? Almighty God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery that we have partaken of today. Father, please make these elements be for us, the very body and blood of Jesus Christ, that we who partake of them may be the very hands and feet of Jesus in most grace and most generosity to an entire world just waiting to be set free in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray. Amen. I love you. Have an incredible day. We invite you to join us in our closing song, Jesus Messiah. He became sin for us, for our salvation. So let's give him glory in this song and lift him up. Philippians 2.8 says, He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man, and was obedient. He was a perfect example even in his death, a criminal's death. By crucifixion. He became sin, knew no sin. We might become his righteousness. He humbled himself, carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing, Jesus Messiah.
name above all names blessed redeemer emmanuel the best people see Father, we thank you. We thank you for so, so many things. The list is endless. If we just would take a few moments of time out of our day to thank you for blessing us in so many ways, but especially with the gift of salvation, that someday we will, we will be in your kingdom and we will be singing and dancing in your home. But in the meantime, we are just grateful that you sing and dance with us here. We love you, Lord, and just pray that as we continue our journey here, um, we, would, we would just trust in you and have faith and be obedient to your calling. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go with God. Go in peace. And be blessed. Come back and see us again next week. Sing it for the loved in vain, overcame, it's not too late.